this is silica fume, etc. You actually improve the cement paste. You improve the interface transition zone. So this is the thing in high spring the concrete. You have the crack goes through the aggregates. Okay. So the appearance of a failure surface actually is depending on the aggregate versus the interface transition zone between the aggregate and the cement paste. So I just mentioned that hypothetically we apply a UNIXO uh, uh, tensile to the concrete. Concrete is brick of material. It is very difficult to determine the direct tensile strength uh, like you do it uh, like you do it for steel. Like for steel, it is very easy, right? You have steel coupon, you grip it to the end, apply a load, right? This is your steel. But in the concrete, uh, in order to apply a Unix or tensile load to the concrete, you need to grip the concrete specimen, right? But the thing is, concrete is brittle material. Oftentimes, when you grip the concrete, it actually damages the concrete locally. So therefore, when you apply, you know, Unix or tensile load, if localized area concrete is damaged, then it will not give accurate results. The other thing is because of a damage in locally when you grip the concrete, it will cause slippage okay, between the grip and the specimen. So therefore, in concrete, uh, typically, even in research lab, even in research laboratory, people do not use uh, direct tensile test to evaluate tensile strength. And to in two indirect uh, tests, uh, which uh, many of you are, are familiar with, uh, one is the they call the bending test. So basically, it's called the, it's a flexural tensile strength. So it's a small prism. Okay? So you apply a, uh, a bending load. So in this uh, uh, kind of a test, so basically it's like your your, your beams, right? So in this case, when you apply a load uh, here. So in this part of the specimen, okay, in the middle here, below the neutral axis, concrete is subject to tension, okay? So in this middle part, above the neutral axis, concrete actually subject to compression, right? So here it's at, a, at, a this, uh, at a the end of this prism. This part you have the concrete subject to highest tensile stress, right? So when the tensile stress exceeds the strength, you have, you break the uh, prism into two, right? So this is actually uh, uh, one of the most commonly used uh, indirect tests, indirectly evaluate the tensile strength of the concrete. So I will let you uh, 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 to uh, read the uh, textbook yourself if you're interested in detail. Uh, the other thing is actually the splitting tensile strength test. So this is actually, you have a cylinder specimen, okay? So you flip it to 90 degree, and then you apply a compressive load on this uh, uh, cylinder specimen. So when you apply a compressive load on the specimen, so you have the part immediately below this loading point, here and here, the concrete is subject to compression. The thing is when you, apply a compressive load to a cylinder specimen. In this direction, concrete is subject to tension, right? So because of the tensile strength of a concrete, it's much smaller compared with the compressive strength. When the concrete expansion, when the tensile stress exceeds the strength, the cylinder specimen split into two, right? So large parts of the cylinder specimen, concrete actually subject to reasonably uniform tensile stress. So when the tensile stress exceeds the strength, you have the split into two half. So that's why we call it the splitting tensile strength test. So this is another method used to indirectly evaluate the tensile strength of the concrete. So the next question you will ask, uh, is there any relationship between the uh, compressive strength and tensile strength? Uh, the answer is yes or no. Uh, yes is that compressive strength and tensile strength are related. However, the relationship is not a linear. So in general, uh, with the increase of a compressive strength, 
the tensile strength, it's also increased, but not as much as the compression strength. So in other words, uh, let's say for ordinary concrete, 30 megapascal, the tensile strength, roughly about 8 to 10 percent of the compressive strength. So if you reduce the water to cement ratio, increase the compressive strength. So when we talk about 100 megapascal high strength of concrete, the tensile strength, maybe it's only 5 percent of the compressive strength. So basically, as the age and the compressive strength increase, the tensile strength versus the compressive strength, the ratio is actually dropped. So the thing is that depending on the testing methods, so if we are talking about a splitting tensile strength versus the compressive strength, splitting tensile strength is roughly about 8 to 14 percent of the compressive strength. But when we talk about a flexural tensile strength, flexural tensile strength is roughly about 11 to 23 percent of the compressive strength. So both are splitting tensile strength and a flexural tensile strength. Both are indirect methods used to evaluate the tensile strength of the concrete. Okay, we talked about uh, elastic modulus and tensile strength. And next I want to talk about the compression. So compression, many of you, most of you in this class are very familiar with as a civil engineer, right? So com compressive strength of a concrete is considered to be the most important characteristics, properties of a concrete. So basically when you do the design, reinforce the concrete structure, okay, concrete grades. This is the thing when you do design. And when you do the design, in the construction, 28-day compressive strength of a concrete is used as for quality, used for quality control. Right. So in general, the 28-day compressive strength of a concrete, determined by a standard uniaxial compressive test, is accepted as a general index of a concrete strength. So, this is the uh, uh, one of the most important things we use the concrete as a material. But in reality, when we talk about the concrete, in reinforced concrete structures, depending on the load conditions, uh, the failure can be complex. Okay? So depending on the type of the loading or stress concrete is under. So I will talk about uh, uh, different uh, uh, loading conditions, how do they actually affect uh, the uh, behavior of uh, concrete. So first, uh, let's talk about uh, the most uh, uh, basic thing. Okay. So we, let's talk about uh, the behavior of a concrete under UniXL short-term compression. So this is the laboratory, and also for quality control, you test a cube and a cylinder to determine the strength of a concrete. So we talked about uh, early on that the micro cracks can be, can be existing inside of the concrete before the concrete is subject to external loading. Let's take a look at this graph here. So the x here is the strain, y here is percentage of compressive strength. So basically, when we look at this curve here, so it can be divided into three zones. So the first zone is when you start loading, up to about 30% of the ultimate load. So during this zone here, so the micro cracks in the interface transition zone, they are stable. So basically, because of this the micro cracks remains stable in the interface transition zone, the first part, the straight strain curve, it's linear. So the next zone, it's actually from about 30 to 40 percent of ultimate load to roughly about 70 percent of load. So in this second zone here, so basically you have an increase in boundary cracking. So the micro cracks in the interface transition zone increases in length and width and the numbers with the increase in the loads. So this is the second part. So the micro cracks in the interface transition zone, because of this increase in length, width, and the numbers, it becomes not stable. 
So the straight strain curve deviated from limit here, right? So this is the one we talked about early on. When we determine the modulus elasticity, ASTM standard, VS standard, one specified 40% of the strength, the other specified 33% of strength. So basically, we're hoping to use the first part, where the straight strain curve is linear, right? Okay, the third zone here, okay, is the increase in micro cracking in the mortar. So when you have a load uh, beyond about 70% of the ultimate load, so the crack begins to form through the mortar. So then you have uh, cracks in mortar, and you have cracks in the interface transition zone. And with the increase of load, the cracks in mortar and the interface transition zone join together to so form a crack and network. So eventually concrete fails. So in this, uh, in this period of increase the cracks in the mortar and formation of a crack and network, you have a straight strain curve bent towards the horizontal. So this is the, uh, um, you, uh, by talking about these uh, different uh, zones. So initially you have, when you have a less than 30% of ultimate load, you have a stable crack in the interface, okay? So the next part, with the increase of uh, compressible load, you have increased the length, the crack length, and the width, and the numbers of a crack in the interface transition zone. The third part, beyond the 70% of the uh, ultimate load, so you have a for, sorry, you have a formation of a cracks in the mortar. So you have a formation of a network of cracks to joining the crack in the interface and in the mortar. Okay, beyond this uh, maximum load, okay, so typical testing machine, so for plain concrete so without a fiber, so what you have is this descending, ascending portion. So you don't get to this part. But some of the uh, uh, more rigid uh, machine, you are able to get to the descending portion. So basically, this descending portion from microstructure, if you look at the concrete inside, it basically has a crack opening. Okay? So this is basically when the concrete is subject to unixl compressive loading, what happens? So how crack propagates. So this was, uh, okay, next thing we want to talk about is the distribution of strength and the stress in water and aggregate. So we learned in previous uh, a few slides, modulus elasticity of a cement paste and aggregate can be very different, right? So when you have this material, very different modulus elasticity, you put it together to make the concrete. So when the concrete is subject to external loading, in the interface between the aggregate and the cement paste, there will be stress concentration. So this, this work was actually published uh, quite a long time ago. Uh, so basically, it gave you some information on the stress and the strength inside the concrete, right? And so first, let's take a look at this uh, uh, graph here. So this graph here gives you the information in terms of the strength at the different locations in the concrete. So these are the aggregate, cross aggregates. Okay? So this line here, dashed line, are the average strength. Okay? So you can see here the peaks here, okay? the high strength in the concrete occurs at the boundary between the aggregate and the cement paste. So the localized strength may be as much as 4.5 times the average strength when the concrete is subject to external loading as a constant here. So the next graph here is actually, um, here is the stress, okay? So again, these are the aggregates. The dashed line here is the average stress. So again, you can see that the high stress, okay, the peak of this uh, high stress area are the boundary area between the aggregate and the cement paste. The localized stress may be more than twice as high as the average stress. Okay. So from composite material point of view, 
Okay, so we have a tool material with a very different amount of elasticity. So under load, we have stress concentration, we have a high strain and a high stress. That will give you the information. That leads to the fact that when the ordinary concrete fell, it fell through the boundary area between the aggregate and the cement paste. So this is one thing, stress concentration. The other thing we talked about early on, we have the interface transition zone. That interface transition zone, actually it's weaker than your bulk of cement paste, right? We have a higher porosity, less CSH more crystalline materials. So both factor weak interface transition zones and a stress concentration leads to a failure of a concrete, where ordinary concrete, when you do the test, the crack goes through the interface transition zone around the aggregate particles. Next, let's look at uh, this uh, hypothetical uh, uh, unit model, okay? And we'll, this is uh, a model here. Let's say you have the aggregated particles. So here you have the cement paste, right? So this is a hypothetical model. So if you have this unit cell with the aggregate in the middle, if you have uh, this unit cell subject to unit cell compressive load, what happens? Okay, so basically, if we have a unit cell here, so if you apply a compressive load, unit cell compressive load on this uh, specimen, in the lateral direction, the specimen will expand, right? So what happens is that we talked about concrete has low tensile strength, right? So when the concrete is subject to unit cell compressive load, what happens is that in lateral direction, when concrete is subject to tension, the first thing will happen is tensile bond failure between the aggregate and the paste. So if you increase the load, next thing you will have shear bond failure okay, between the aggregate and the cement paste here. So if you further increase the load, so what we'll have is tensile matrix failure. Okay. So eventually, you further increase the load. So this is what you observe after the testing. You see the cracks go around the aggregate through the interface transition zone. So this is the most of the situation. But we know that when we talk about a rock-based aggregates, so aggregates are from the rocks, right? So depending on if you have a localized floors, so occasionally aggregator can fail if you have a localized floor in certain piece of the aggregates. So one other thing actually, uh, when we talk about you apply a unixol compressive load to a concrete specimen, so in this lateral direction, concrete subject to tension, right? So there are two things which can lead to the failure. One thing is that a tensile stress exceeds the tensile strength. That can lead to failure. The other thing is tensile strength exceeds the tensile strength capacity can also cause a failure. So the question is, which is dominant? So in general, uh, it has been suggested that a failure is controlled not by limiting the tensile stress, but by a limiting tensile strength in the order of 1 to 2 multiple 10 to the minus, 10 to the power of the minus 4. So in other words, the question is whether its stress exceeds the tensile strength cause of failure, or whether it's due to tensile strength, tensile strength exceeded the tensile strength capacity. So it is suggested that concrete failure is due to the tensile strength exceeded the tensile strength capacity. Um, okay, let's take a break. Uh,